Every once in a while, someone comes along and says, that man greener up in Siberia is all right. Everywhere throughout the East, I received unfavorable reports of Mr. Greener, our commercial agent at Vladivostok. His habits are said to be extremely bad. He has represented the United States as consul at Vladivostok with credit to himself and his race. There was a long article in the Downey Vostok about this same Mr. Greener, a regular cheap politician's puff, which could have been dictated by no one but himself. Among other things in this article were the facts that he was a close personal friend of both McKinley and Day. He informs everyone he meets that he speaks several languages, and then to back up his statement, he usually drags in some French phrase. He goes swelling around town with a flag about four inches long, pinned with an eagle to his waistcoat, and a flag pin in his tie, so of course everybody knows who he is. I know my own worth, the strength of my pen and my voice, and the character of my determination. I stumbled across Greener in my teaching at Howard. At one point, one of my colleagues, uh, an older colleague, in looking at my course on, on Russian history, he said, have you ever heard of Richard Greener? And I said, no. And he just walked away. <laughs> and so I went to the library. That's, that's what you're supposed to do uh, in those uh, situations. And the more I looked, the more I found. Richard Greener lived a life full of contradictions. The more you look at him, the more you find, and the harder it is to understand him. I'm Abby Mullen, and this is Consolation Prize, a podcast about the history of the United States and the world through the eyes of its consuls. Today, we're going to explore the complicated life of Richard Greener and ask ourselves, what kind of a man was he really? Well, you decide. He was a scrappy kid born in 1844 to parents who had never been slaves, born in, in Philadelphia. His father was a steward on ships out of the Philadelphia Naval Yard. They moved to Massachusetts, to, to Boston, when Greener was about five or so. This is Catherine Chaddock, who wrote a biography of Richard Greener. And he went to public schools there in Cambridge. Cambridge had integrated schools, but the rest of Boston did not. His father went off to the gold rush in California and was never seen again. He was an only child. He left school at about 11, started supporting his mom, but a scrappy kid who loved everything about Boston. There were all these abolition meetings at the time, you know, this is 1850s. And so he would go to them. He got to meet Oliver Wendell Holmes. He became friends with, with Charles Sumner and, and uh, you know, all sorts of people. And he would go to these little meetings. He'd be in the back. He thought everything was exciting. So he ended up with a mentor, a wealthier gentleman named Augustus Batchelder. And his mentor made sure that he got some sort of individual schooling of his own, a little bit of tutoring from Batchelder's friends and so forth, and then said, let's get you to Oberlin. He went to Oberlin. From there, he went to Phillips Academy Andover. And from there, he went to Harvard, all on the encouragement and money, frankly, of this August Batchelder. In fact, Greener was the first Black graduate of Harvard College. According to Alison Blakely, who studies the history of Black people in Russia, Greener had big plans. If you looked at his, his career during uh, Reconstruction, he demonstrated that he was really a very broadly trained and, and also very ambitious uh, individual. In 1873, Greener was invited to join the faculty of the University of South Carolina as a professor of mental and moral philosophy. And he did. He loved it at USC. South Carolina was an integrated state, and Greener felt at home in both the black and white populations he was around. And then, in 1877, 
the federal troops left South Carolina. Reconstruction was over. Jim Crow had begun. Greener was no longer welcome in this place that he called his home. So he had to pick up and start over in Washington, D.C. And this is when Greener started thinking more seriously about what it means to be a black intellectual. Greener epitomized uh, the talented tenth. This is a concept that uh, was originally advanced by white philanthropists to designate roughly the proportion of the black population that was educated and capable of making constructive contributions to advancing the interest of American society. I think this is how they, they conceived it. In the late 19th century, the black community appropriated the term. This community included educated black men such as W.E.B. Du Bois and also Alexander Crummel, who was the leader of the American Negro Academy. Greener was a part of this group. He took various teaching jobs, including at Howard University. He also became a popular public speaker. In his speeches, he tried to argue that black people had always been a part of the fabric of the United States. Another difficulty of this white problem is the universal belief that somehow the Negro race began its career with President Lincoln's proclamation. All such novices would do well to look up their old histories, newspapers, and pamphlets. Next to the Indian, he is probably of the purest racial stock in the country, and as has been stated, whatever accession has come to him has been from the choicest blood of the country. He has been thoroughly identified with it from the beginning. He was the agricultural laborer and the artisan at the South, the trusted servant and companion. At the North, he took part in all mechanical pursuits, helped build the houses, worked on the first newspapers, made the first woodcuts, and was the best pressman at Charleston, Philadelphia, and Boston. In every industrial, social, and political movement, as well as in different warlike struggles, he has borne an honorable part, which to profess ignorance of is not creditable, or if denied, shows willful prejudice. He was on the heights of Abraham with Wolfe, in the French and Indian Wars with Braddock. The first martyr of the revolution is seen in Trumbull's picture retreating with the patriots from Bunker Hill, musket in hand, Washington did not disdain to share a blanket with him on the cold ground at Valley Forge, at the South with Marion and Green, at the North with Washington and Gates, with Wayne and Allen. He who doubts the record can read it from the pen of Negro historians, from Nell or Williams or Wilson. For of those who perform the deeds and those who write, many such are praised. No sneer of race, no assumption of superiority, no encrusted prejudice will ever obscure this record, much less obliterate it. And while it stands, it is the Negro's passport to every right and privilege of every other American. And then it was just a question of how they make a contribution to try to end the injustice and, and to advance the interests of their people. And in some cases, frankly, if they could, they would have accepted becoming white. But, and, and, and by the way, he could pass for white often, and sometimes uh, he did. So th th there were these internal struggles that, that they were dealing with, in addition to the obvious uh, you know, everyday restrictions their, their sense of self and, and what they could do and, and what they could do that would be contributing uh, to advancing uh, their people. Greener began to situate himself amongst other Black activists like Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. None of these men had exactly the same beliefs about what should happen to the Black population of the United States, but Greener tended to align more with Du Bois in... What came to be kind of an ongoing debate uh, between those who followed 
the views of Du Bois and those who followed Washington's around the turn of the century. I, I, I think in order to understand that, you, you need to see it as part of a much wider issue that in my view, they were addressing it. And it's an underlying and, and in some ways still unresolved uh, question. And that's something I, I mentioned a little earlier. That is, what's the appropriate place for Blacks in American society? In the case of Washington, he was basically asserting that it was too early for Black people to demand full uh, economic and political uh, equality. Du Bois, on the other hand, was insisting that it was already late, that it should have been demanded all along, and that it was time to fully realize it. And the only other thing I think you should realize about uh, Washington, if, if you read uh, his correspondence, you'll find that the Washington that you see in, in those correspondences is, is not exactly that same Washington you, you see that's juxtaposed to uh, Du Bois. Washington was a little, he was a deeper thinker than his, his white establishments uh, supporters thought. He was, he was much more pragmatic and, and was trying to do what he thought would work best in order to advance uh, even incrementally uh, the situation of Blacks. Du Bois was unwilling to compromise and he was just insisting that the longer you wait, uh, the longer it's gonna take. Uh, du Bois and Greener, I'm not going to say they were snobs, but they thought of themselves as, in a sense, better. And so how dare American society keep even them with all of their ability and accomplishments? How dare they put up such artificial barriers? So they didn't look down on Washington because they knew he was doing good work, but they thought that this was counterproductive in terms of the ultimate achievement of social justice. Even though Greener spoke on behalf of the rights of Black Americans, it sometimes seemed to some of his Black acquaintances that he was trying to take advantage of being light-skinned. They thought that maybe he was becoming too white. And he didn't help his own case when he agreed to work with a group that was trying to build a tomb for President Ulysses S. Grant. In order to work on the commission for Grant's tomb, Greener and his family moved to New York. Unfortunately for Greener and his future career, he was the only Black person on that commission. Everybody else, whether they were on the board of directors or on some other committee, were white people. So. People back in Washington and, and South Carolina were hearing about him, and he doesn't associate with Blacks anymore. Greener vehemently denied these accusations. I am free to challenge any man to produce an instance, one, where during my residence in New York, I ever failed to act or use my influence for the race. But it was so easy for him and his family to just fit in. His family stayed in New York, but he and his wife were not having the best relationship. And um, also his family was living in a, an apartment building that was all white people except them. And they were sort of presumed to be white and they didn't say anything else about it. And he finally moved out and moved to another part of New York in a sort of a trial separation situation, we would call it now and um, did his lawyering what he could, which was not great. I mean, it, you know, it was just hard. He also taught, he tutored students at night and cobbled together several different ways of, of making a living after the Grant Monument Association. Then, lucky for him, he always liked politicians and politics, and he was asked to be part of the McKinley campaign 
Now, Greener got asked to be a part of the McKinley campaign because he lobbied really hard to be asked to be a part of the McKinley campaign. And when McKinley won the election, Greener saw his chance to get out of town. His relationship with his family had disintegrated, he was at odds with many in the black community, and... The fact is, I need a change of scene. So he asked President McKinley for a consular appointment. Initially, Greener wanted to go to Bombay, but then there was a plague there, so he didn't go. There had been black consuls before Greener, but they had all been sent to Latin American or African countries. Greener got an appointment to Vladivostok in Russia, where he would be the first black American consul in a mostly white country. But to some people, like Alexander Crummel, Greener didn't seem particularly black. I have no objection to his being a white man, but I do object to his coming back to our ranks and then getting on my Negro's shoulders to hoist himself as a Negro into some political office. On the way to Vladivostok in August of 1898, Greener didn't feel the need to broadcast his race. Since I have been at sea, from sun and tan, I am one of the blackest fellows on board, except a few of the deck crew. But my blood is good, and the red is in my cheek and on my hands, so I manage to pass. I look narrowly at times to see if I can observe any special attention to myself, but thus far, if felt... It is not exhibited by look or act. Once he got to Vladivostok, he threw himself into the work of the consul or the commercial agent. Although he was appointed and approved as consul, once he got there, the Russians themselves didn't want anyone with the name consul in in Vladivostok for some reason. They wanted it only in St. Petersburg. So he became commercial agent. That was great. Commerce was hopping in Vladivostok. They had just figured out how to keep their, their harbor from icing in the winter and open all the time. They had Japan, Korea, China nearby. The Trans-Siberian Railroad had just come to Vladivostok. So things were really hopping for the possibility of commerce, even from the United States. And the US government had suddenly decided on an open door policy. The Pacific was, was a big jumping off place, et cetera he had a lot to do because he was exploring for the first time, what are the commercial opportunities here for U.S. businesses? He would write long reports. He would would talk, talk, talk to people of all kinds and not just the Russians. Uh, He would write reports that had to do with no cheap goods, really expensive goods, but goods that say U.S. on them, blah, blah, blah. And then he also would start writing reports about the future. Oh, here, here, they've just opened up a new educational opportunity here with a, a little college in, in this part of Vladivostok. And here they've done this. His reporting was voluminous. Greener wanted the United States to claim more authority in Siberia. He wanted them to create a consulate general. They didn't, at least not then. He also supervised the evacuation from Sakhalin Island during the Russo-Japanese War. And he wrote a lot of reports about the war. He seemed very happy. But some people thought he was too free with the rules and regulations of being a consul and too flamboyant to be a good, respectable representative of the United States. This dislike might not have had anything to do with his race at all, just his personality. He was also busy with a young woman, Mishi Kawashima, who he sort of took as a common law wife because they were together for almost the whole time he was in Vladivostok until, you know, 1905. Mishi was from a little town in Japan. She had traveled the world as a nanny. She had been in all sorts of countries. She spoke many languages. And they ended up having three children. She went back to her little village in Japan every time they had a child. And then she would come back. At some point, he got her appointed. Of course, not saying he knew her at all. He needed 
a paid Japanese speaking errant person who got her appointed by the US government to be that too. So they were a two income family. And there was not really any indication as to how much Mishi knew about his status as a Black person. This life seemed to suit Greener so well, but it wouldn't last. There were mixed reports about whether Greener was actually doing a good job in Vladivostok. In particular, one member of the State Department, Third Assistant Secretary of State Herbert Pierce, seems to have really taken a dislike to him. There were accusations of corruption. And then Greener's political fortunes changed. Well, of course, McKinley was assassinated. And apparently what Teddy Roosevelt and others before him had always said or decided, if somebody is appointed by somebody as part of their four-year term, they should get to serve out that term, that McKinley term, even though McKinley was no longer president and Teddy Roosevelt was. And so that made Greener pretty happy. He wanted to stay there. He, he, he liked it there. Well, then when Roosevelt himself got his own presidency and got his own elected office in 1904, he had his own people he owed favors to. Most of the diplomatic corps wrote to him and said, you know, I resign at that point, you know, knowing that at that point, you allow that person to either reappoint you or appoint his own friends, the people that did him favors to get him elected. Greener was a little naive about that kind of thing. He thought, well, maybe I could, I, I've succeeded as a consular. Maybe I, I should be one forever. Why wouldn't he reappoint me? I'm not going to resign and so forth. So he finally got the word Oh, we've appointed somebody else to take your place. And uh, after many machinations, Booker T. Washington trying to get Roosevelt to appoint one of his friends and so forth. Greener hadn't really been that friendly, although he wasn't unfriendly with Booker T. Washington. But eventually Roosevelt did appoint somebody, actually a, um, a white man who knew very good Russian and Japanese, whose parents had been missionaries and so forth whose last name was Green. I mean, go figure. And Greener was recalled. Not only did Greener lose his post, he lost another family. His common-law wife did not come back to the States with him. She was reluctant to ever travel back to the States with him, but she thought there was enough discrimination about, about Japanese people and Asian people in the United States. So she talked about discrimination. You couldn't tell whether she was talking about to him or to her. Their three children never seemed to know that their, their father was considered a Black American. He was shocked when he got back and he couldn't convince anybody in the Teddy Roosevelt administration to send him back overseas. And, you know, he really thought that doing the job was the thing. And he had done a good job. And he had gotten some accolades. He had also gotten some 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 bad news about, oh, gee, you know, he was too forceful in this. He was too that, you know, whatever, some combination of things. But he had achieved and he just thought that was enough. But he was politically naive in that. And actually, Teddy Roosevelt did reduce the number of black appointees overseas from what they had been appointing before him. For an ambitious Black politician and, and professional, a lot of the consuls were lawyers and all other, uh, let's say, professions. But in all of those other professions, racism limited the extent to which they could fully realize their potential. And, and from the government's perspective, they were granting these kinds of appointments basically as rewards for service. Uh, or anticipated service from these uh, Black elites because at least up until the early 20th century, the Republican Party in particular wanted to be able to take the Black vote for granted, the bulk of the Black vote, uh, 
was Republican because it was the party of Lincoln, all the way up to the Great Depression, in fact. But by the beginning of the 20th century, it was no longer uh, something that the party felt it needed because the kind of voter suppression that we're, we're, <laughs> we're seeing rehearsed and revived <laughs> right now had uh, been taking full effect with Jim Crow to an extent where the, the black vote was not any longer anything they needed to worry about. But for, for blacks who accepted these appointments, there was also the opportunity for broadening their worlds. They could go places that were beyond the imagination of, of most of the black population. And it had the added benefit, and this was one of the, the things that increased their inner kinds of struggles with themselves, they could be in positions that they couldn't have imagined they could be in in the United States. Black activists had criticized Greener for not being Black enough, but he also wasn't white. So he remained an outsider in the institutions that he had been a trailblazer for. Who is this Professor Greener? He's nothing less than a graduate from old Harvard. I know him well, and I knew his mother before him. But what does society care about a Harvard graduate if his complexion is tinged with the hated color? I think that's what actually was the driving force, just, just fierce resentment that that little bit of pigmentation in his skin was accounting for his being excluded from what he thought his rightful place in the world should have been. When he returned to the United States in 1905, Greener eventually got involved in the Niagara Movement, which is the forerunner of the NAACP. If you list out his accomplishments, they seem pretty impressive. First Black Harvard graduate, first Black professor at the University of South Carolina, dean of the law school at Howard University, first Black consul to Vladivostok, founder of the Niagara Movement. And yet for Greener and those around him, it never felt like enough. When he died, his friend Francis Grimke eulogized him this way, maybe not entirely fairly. My old and dear friend, Professor Richard T. Greener, is being laid to rest in Chicago at this very hour Friday afternoon. He died suddenly on Tuesday morning. I have known him for 50 years, and during most of that time, we have been close friends. He was generous, big-hearted fellow, gifted in speech, widely read, finely educated, a man of broad culture. He had his faults, of course. He made mistakes. He had unfortunate family troubles and other troubles laterally in connection with his work as consul in Siberia, which soured him, and which made his latter days anything but happy. He gave the appearance of a disappointed man. Life had not yielded him all that he expected. Another thing which contributed to his unhappiness was the feeling, I think, that... He was not appreciated as he ought to have been by the members of his race. With all his brilliancy of intellect and abundant stores of knowledge, he seemed to lack steadiness of purpose, the willingness to settle down to some one line of work and give himself unreservedly to it. The result is, he accomplished less than men who were far inferior to him in mental equipment and training. We all loved him for his many good qualities, and our only regret was that he did not stick to some one thing and put his strength into it, strength of intellect and enthusiasm. Consolation Prize is a podcast of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. This episode was produced by me, Abby Mullen, along with Deep Thumurley. 
Special thanks to our experts, Catherine Chaddock and Allison Blakely, and a special shout out to Christy Pacicaro for additional consulting on this story. Our voice actors for this episode were Brandon Buck, Andrew Garland, Eric Gonzaba, Jessica Mack, Chioki Ianson, Seth Savine, Josh Dew, and Jordan Hawk. You should definitely check out Chioki's Community Media Center at Virginia Commonwealth University's Institute for Contemporary Art, and also check out Josh's company, Vagrant Coffee, in Baltimore, Maryland. Our music is by Andrew Cody. Thanks for listening.